The operators of two Japanese nuclear facilities will take a closer look at active faults running directly beneath reactor buildings. They'll try to determine if there's a safety threat. The faults lie beneath Kansai Electric Power's Mihama nuclear power plant and the Japan Atomic Energy Agency's Monju Experimental Fast Breeder Reactor. Both are in central Japan. Officials at the facilities will conduct underground surveys to get a more detailed picture of the geology. Japan's Nuclear and Industrial Safety Agency ordered the operators to conduct the examinations. Agency officials warn that shifting faults could cause reactor buildings to move even if the faults lie 500 to 1,000 meters away. The operators will try to determine when the faults moved in the past. They'll look at geographical features around the facilities and the nearby sea. The surveys will take six months to complete. The facility's operators say they'll report their findings by the end of March. Video shot immediately after the accident documents how Tokyo Electric Power Company responded. On today's Nuclear Watch, we'll review some of the footage and discuss what it reveals. TEPCO released portions of the video earlier this month, more than a year and a half after the disaster. It was taken during teleconferences between workers at the Fukushima Daiichi nuclear plant and officials at TEPCO's Tokyo headquarters as they struggled to bring the crisis under control. TEPCO created a 90-minute segment from its hours of footage. It released this to the media for broadcast. The video shows workers panicking in response to a series of explosions at the Fukushima Daiichi nuclear plant. The video is important because it documents TEPCO's initial response to the accident. It could help fill in some of the blanks about what went wrong. NHK World's Kenny Ichiro Okamoto covered the Fukushima Daiichi nuclear power plant accident and its aftermath. He has spent the past weeks reviewing TEPCO's video footage. So, Kenny Ichiro, tell us what you saw. As the saying goes, a picture is worth a thousand words. There are a lot of written documents about the nuclear disaster, but they do not offer a complete picture of what happened. For this reason, I feel that the video is very important. How did TEPCO make the video available? One part consists of 90 minutes of footage taken from the hours of video recorded. TEPCO released this version to the media on August 6th. Some parts of the video were edited to protect the identities of individual workers. TEPCO is also allowing journalists to watch 150 additional hours of video at its Tokyo headquarters for a limited time. There are conditions. The video is shown on computers. No one may download or record the images. Only written memos are allowed. The video is available for viewing only on weekdays and for a maximum of six hours a day. 150 hours of video with six hours a day means that it would take at least 25 days to watch all of the footage. Yes, that's right. But at first, TEPCO says journalists could watch the video only for five days. The company later extended the period to one month. I have discovered many things by watching the video. That was just after the number one reactor exploded. A senior officer at TEPCO's headquarters announces that members of the accident task force can leave. The video shows most senior members, including TEPCO's president, immediately leaving the room after the announcement. Now, TEPCO says that these people remained inside the company buildings. But the video raises questions. TEPCO must have more footage. Is there any chance they will release all the video? Well, TEPCO is reluctant to make any of the video public. They say the teleconferences are for internal communication. 
They also say the company does not legally have to release the video. But the video footage is a variable record of the nuclear disaster, not only for Japan, but all over the world. NHK will continue to press TEPCO to disclose all information about the accident. NHK World's Keiichiro Okamoto for Nuclear Watch. The Tokyo District Court this week ordered TEPCO to hand over a copy of the video. The court will keep the video as evidence. Tokyo Electric Power Company officials will provide more video showing how they dealt with the aftermath of the nuclear accident at Fukushima Daiichi. They recently released a shortened version of the intense teleconferences over the first five days. Members of the public and the media criticized a partial disclosure. TAPCO spokespersons say they will release video recorded in the month after the disaster. The utility already disclosed 150 hours of video of the teleconferences between its Tokyo head office and the plant. TEPCO banned the media from making copies. The new video documents the days when TEPCO engineers had problems securing water to cool spent fuel pools at Fukushima Daiichi. This reignited fears of further nuclear fallout. Japanese leaders also approved the unannounced release of low-level radioactive water into the ocean during this time. That prompted criticism from neighboring countries. TEPCO spokespersons say they will partially edit the new video despite calls for full disclosure. They have again cited the need to protect their employees' privacy. Government officials have released their blueprint for rebuilding areas at the heart of the nuclear debate. They want to decontaminate and restore lifelines in parts of evacuation zones around Fukushima Daiichi within two years. Reconstruction Minister Tatsuo Hirano released the plan. It covers sections of the zones where evacuation orders have been lifted. Government officials will focus for the first two years on decontamination and on restoring water, sewage and power so residents can live there. They'll offer residents jobs in those areas and in decommissioning the damaged nuclear reactors. Ministry officials aim to restore train and bus services and promote local industries within five years. Their 10-year plan calls for attracting young people to the region. They'll focus on developing new industries, including the production of renewable energies and making medical equipment. Finding places to dispose of radioactive waste from the accident at Fukushima Daiichi has been a struggle. Japanese government officials have proposed a site in Tochigi, north of Tokyo. The proposal is the first of its kind and they've made to a prefectural government. The Environment Ministry's Katsuhiko Yokomitsu outlined the plan to Tochigi Governor Tomikazu Fukuda. The central government is responsible for disposing of more than 42,000 tons of radioactive ash and mud in nine prefectures. Levels of cesium in the waste exceed the government standard of 8,000 becquerels per kilogram. Tochigi Prefecture is already temporarily storing about 9,000 tons of radioactive waste at sewage treatment and other facilities. Environment Ministry officials say a four-hectare national forest in Yaita City is large enough and far enough from residential areas. The government wants to store radioactive waste in drums at the site in an underground concrete facility. It also wants to dig wells to check whether radioactive materials are seeping into groundwater. The government says the level of radioactivity in the air would not exceed one hundredth of one millisievert, the maximum annual amount not considered damaging to human health. We need to courteously explain to the residents why the place was chosen. We'll do our best to get them to understand the facility will be safe. Yaita Mayor Tadashi Endo said the proposal came out of the blue without any consultation. Someone has to take the waste. I'm worried. I have a small child. The government plans to win local consent by holding briefings for local residents and start construction around summer next year. It hopes to take the waste to its final disposal site by 2014. The government also plans to ask other prefectures this month about accepting radioactive waste.
Radioactive contamination has been has been detected throughout Japan and which is almost even worse is that also in Hawaii and in the western United States, the, particularly in the water and milk sources. Peaches produced in Fukushima will go on sale in Thailand next week. It's the first overseas sale of products harvested in the prefecture since last year's accident at the Fukushima Daiichi nuclear plant. Fukushima growers have campaigned hard to stress the safety of their food products and had them undergo numerous radiation tests. Many countries have halted or restricted food imports from Fukushima due to fears of radioactive contamination. Now about 800 peaches will be exported to Thailand. They will be sold at a department store and a large shopping mall in Bangkok. Last month, Fukushima prefectural officials invited department store and trade company agents from Thailand to give them a tour of peach orchards and facilities that check radiation. I'm very delighted because we can now help to dispel rumors about alleged radiation contamination. We'll continue to promote the safety of our products. Workers at the oldest nuclear plant in France got a scare when steam started leaking from the facility. But the operator says no radioactivity got out. The leak occurred at the Fessenheim complex in eastern France near the German border. Electricité de France operates the plant. The release took place during regular maintenance in a separate building from the one housing the reactor. A spokesperson for the company said hydrogen peroxide mixed with water and caused a chemical reaction. That resulted in the release of steam. Officials from the plant's union say two workers were slightly burned. A small fire broke out at the 34-year-old plant in April. President Francois Hollande has pledged to close the facility during his term. The Japanese people's growing distrust of nuclear power now has a price tag. The industry ministry says it will cost more than $600 billion to go non-nuclear by the year 2030. A recent opinion poll suggests that's what half the population wants. Yukio Edano spoke at a meeting of cabinet ministers in charge of energy policy. He said the cost of building renewable energy infrastructure would add up. He pointed to the expense of constructing generating facilities and power lines. Edano warned that immediately shutting down reactors would cut the power supply by 30 percent. He said going non-nuclear would weaken the country's bargaining position when buying oil and natural gas. The government has promised to draft a new energy policy. Ministers are working on scenarios for ending nuclear dependence while compensating for lost power generation. A new breakthrough in genome research could change our understanding of the human body and the treatment of hundreds of diseases. An international team of scientists announced its discovery on Thursday about our so-called genetic control panel. Researchers at the Encyclopedia of DNA Elements, or ENCODE project, found that some 80% of the genome triggers biochemical functions. It was previously thought only some 2% played such a role, with the rest being so-called junk DNA. By genetically sequencing 147 types of cells, the team tried to identify the function of each part of the genome. They found at least more than 80% of it performs biochemical functions such as switching on a gene to produce a protein at an appropriate time and location. Japan's researchers from the State Bank Institute, Miken, say further study may lead to the discovery of new medicines and treatments for diseases caused by abnormal protein production. Such illnesses include cancer and dementia. A group of photographers plans to hold an exhibition on the March 11 disaster at the world's largest imaging equipment fair. The Japan Professional Photographer Society says it will show 116 photos at the event in Cologne, Germany. 73 professional and amateur photographers contributed the work. I hope these photos let people know about the tragedy and get them to think about how to escape such disasters. 
The group also plans to show the photos in other German cities.